Good morning, church. Good morning, and welcome to Bloomfield Congregational Church, where no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you said about yourself in the mirror this morning, no matter what anybody said in the papers or online about you, if you are looking to learn more about love and you are not a jerk to other people when you are here, then you are welcome here no matter what. I am Pastor Sean. It is a blessing to be here with you today. If you would like to get more closely connected with this vibrant and relative, relevant community of faith that is doing its best to add hope and joy and peace and love into this community and into the world, then there are a bunch of ways that you can learn more about us or get more closely associated with us. The first is just join us after service and just talk with people, get a feel for who we are and what we are all about. Another way is to grab this welcome card in the pews, uh, scan the QR code to get to our link tree that has all kinds of different information about our community of faith, or you can join a number of other people who have already reached out to us to ask about joining as members and partners to this community of faith. We've already had three new member Sundays this year, and we're going to have one more uh, probably in December. So if you're interested, please let me know. Please let Carolyn Delgado know, who's our chair of deacons, or anybody else, and they'll direct you for what we and what you would like to do. So today is Harvest Sunday. If you're wondering what all of this is, we provide Thanksgiving baskets, 66 Thanksgiving baskets full of food for Thanksgiving and then a gift card for them to be able to, people to be able to buy whatever they would like to buy that is culturally appropriate for them. Not everybody likes turkey. So we, uh, we do that and so thank you for doing this. During the opening hymn, uh, those of you who had not already placed things up here are invited to come forward during the opening hymn and bring the food here. Please come up the center aisle and then go back up over the sides and then the food will remain here in the sanctuary until after the service where we will bring it out into Fellowship Hall and you can participate if you would like to in sorting it all out as we get ready to provide those to social services by the end of the week. Uh, also later today at 3 p.m. is going to be a concert put on by the Wintonberry Historical Society, who is celebrating its 75th anniversary. It's going to be a piano concert and show tunes, so you are welcome to be here at 3 o'clock for that. Also today at 11.30, if you're interested in learning more about the virtual reality program that we have going on here, John DeHoyos will be leading a conversation and some demo uh, for that if you are interested in learning more. In addition to that, um, we have a three-to-one fundraising challenge. Some very generous donors, as well as the National Office of the United Church of Christ, have provided an opportunity for us to raise $30,000 for this project if we can raise 10. It's very unusual to be able to do that, and so if you are willing to donate to that, you can do it via Tithely. There is a line on Tithely for that, or you can provide a check and just put virtual reality. Uh, on the or VR in the notes section or donate in other ways if you would like to do that. Next Sunday the 24th is our annual interfaith Thanksgiving service. It will be held again this year at Bethel AME uh, on 1154 Blue Hills Avenue. For those of you who are looking for a place where you can see people, a lot of people come together from different faiths or no faith background and join and worship and be and praise and hope together in a time where we feel so much division. Here is a wonderful opportunity to do that. There's more information uh, online as well as in the E! News if you would like to learn more about that. Also, two Sundays from today is December 1st. Two Sundays from today is the beginning of Advent. If you feel peace and hope in that, then you have a really good feel for what Advent and Christmas are about. If that made you wince, because you're worried about what you have to do and all that kind of stuff, that's not Advent. That's commercial Christmas. And so please join us for our season of journey to joy for Advent. Now let us join together as we say our responsive call to worship. The words will be on screen. What is prayer? Is it a vending machine to get what we want? Is prayer a negotiation? God, if I do this, will you do that? Prayer is a path. Prayer is a journey. It's a journey where we have the opportunity to draw 
closer to God. Now is the time where we will bring forward our harvest donations. If you would like to bring the food forward that you brought, if you brought any, you're welcome to do so. There is also a basket there if you wanted to donate money or a check, but there is no obligation at all, and do not feel embarrassed if you do not wish to bring anything. There's a lot going on here, and we appreciate whatever you do. So now let us join together in our opening hymn as we bring forward our harvest offerings. be seated. In place of our unison prayer, we're going to be doing a blessing of the food and the harvest that has been brought forth here. So please, in whatever way is appropriate for you, send your blessing on this as we pray here. Gracious God, thank you for the generosity of this community of faith. Thank you for the blessing of our ability to have enough, to know we have enough to give to our neighbors, to give to others. It is not just the food that will help, but it's the knowledge that somebody who they may have never met, some place that they may never enter, cares. So that we know, so they know there is a connection between us, that there are connections that we do not even feel sometimes, connections that are made possible because of your way that you created us to be, not to be me, 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 I, I, I alone, but to be us, to be we, whether we know each other or not, whether we have ever met in person or not, whether we are here in the sanctuary or somewhere throughout the world online. And let us know that this matters and that it is more than just what we see here, that you imbue this so that when people receive it, they receive something from you. And that gives them hope, that gives us hope in a time that we so desperately, desperately needed. In your name we pray, 
Amen. And now may the peace of God be with you. Please offer a sign of grace and peace to your neighbor. faster than me today. Look at all these beautiful gifts of food. How lovely. So I have a question to ask you. Do you like to talk? No? no. no? Yes. yes? yes. You like to talk? Yes. I like to talk. Do you like to talk? Yes. Yeah. But there's one little thing that I want to explain, and that's prayer. Prayer. How is that talking? Who can tell me? It's a part of your life. Right. Prayer. Talking to God. Isn't that a wonderful opportunity 
to talk to God. It's wonderful. It's a conversation. Just like you have conversations with your friends and your family, prayer is a conversation with God. And that is something we are so, so happy to be able to do at any given moment, any day. Are you ready to talk about prayer more? Let's go to Sunday school. We'll now have the pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of thin spaces, help us to feel and to draw closer to you. Help us to want to and to aspire to and try to draw closer to you because we need you. The world needs you now more than ever. Please be with this community of faith and all communities of faith to be places of boldness, justice, compassion, joy in the midst of it all, and most of all, love in action. We ask for your intervention. We pray for your intervention for those who are suffering in all kinds of forms, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. We pray for those who are grieving from losses, things that happened this morning, things that happened yesterday or a week ago or 10 years ago or more. We ask you to be with those who are struggling financially, that they may know that even though some people in Western society may judge them based on what they have, that that is not the ultimate value upon which we each have innately as children of God. We pray for those struggling with addiction, that they may have an hour, a day, a week's strength, and for all the people who bear the consequences of those addictions. We pray for those dealing with mental illness, that we may first and foremost never add stigma or shame on top of a condition that they already deal with, often silently. We pray for our country, our country and our town, both suffering from conflict and pain and race-based fighting. For those who feel under attack for being just who they are, created as they were intended to be by God, We pray for those who are struggling, who feel like they are alone and like they don't belong anywhere. And we ask for your strength and support to encourage us to have the courage to go out and not just be that place, but to let other people know that we are that place. Being willing to take the risk of walking up to that individual who seems troubled or the group of people who need help and say, even if they reject us or refuse to come, to say there is a place that they can go so that they know even if they never walk through the doors that such a place exists. We pray for those who are dealing with suicidal ideation. And we want you to know that how you feel right now is not how it always will be, that you are not alone, that you indeed do have purpose, that you have meaning, that this world needs you, that we need you, and that if you want to know where you can make a difference, you can make it here, right in this community of faith, whether you live in Bloomfield or Connecticut, or if you don't at all, because you are welcome here no matter where you are in this world. Please be especially with Erie, the Meehan family, Doreen and the DeCarly family, and all those who have lost family members. For Pat, Sully Foster, Jenny Edelson, Michael, Kevin, Winifred, Raul, Bill, Flossie, Dahlia and Edwin, Monica, and all those who are seeking healing and justice in this world. For Donna Hubbs on the death of her uncle yesterday. And for all those who are on our hearts but whose names were not lifted up here. Please be with each of us to discern your will with wisdom and to call up the courage to follow your way, a way that has the potential to save us and to save the world. And now, as Jesus himself taught us together, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day 
our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. There was a man whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on, year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, nor razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went away and ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Please bless this reading. When I was in college, I used to get stressed out a lot about certain exams, particularly final exams, and especially when they stacked up on each other, like two in a day or three or four in two days. And it would be almost debilitating for me at some times, particularly the ones that I thought were going to be determinations of what I was going to have for a future or not. Unnecessary pressure because I did not understand that this was not the end of the world if I did not do well on these exams. At that time, it felt like it would be, and so I would negotiate with God, and I would say, God, if you help me get through this, I promise next semester that I will go to church every Sunday. Anybody ever do anything like this? 
Sometimes there were situations in my life that were more painful, more stressful, more difficult, and I would actually say, God, can you just help me skip from where I am right now to wherever it is in the future that I'm going to be okay? And whether I believed that would actually happen or not, in my mind, I was actually processing, would I be willing, and the answer was yes, would I be willing to give up these days, these weeks or months, whatever it was to get me from where I was and what I was feeling in that moment to get me to the end of that point then? And there were other times when I would pray 24 years ago when my mom was dying from pancreatic cancer only at the time, I was a corporate executive in the healthcare industry, and I had the access to the best executives in the healthcare industry in the world, the best doctors, the best everything, and everybody let me know that at that time, which is different 24 years later, but at that time was an absolute terminal diagnosis, and there was really nothing that could be done. I knew that, and so my prayers, and my mom knew it as well, and so we would pray together, and I would pray, and she would pray for her peace and transition. She was an incredibly faithful person and never lost that to the very last breath that she had, but there are other members of the family who just desperately wanted that cure. And until the last hours before refused to give up on that cure, created stress on my mom, created stress on themselves, and they were praying for her healing. They had people in her community of faith coming in to hold hands on her and try to heal her. They were praying for her physical healing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it didn't happen. My prayers were answered. Her prayers were answered for a peaceful, quick transition. Their prayers were not, and yet there are other people who are in the same circumstance who see their family members withering away, their minds dying, praying for a quick transition, and even that doesn't happen, which begs the question, does prayer work? In this country, there are half the people praying for one result, half the people prayed for another result. The question is, does prayer work? work. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today and what this passage deals with in ways that you might not expect. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 1 through 20. There's a certain man whose name was Elkanah. Thank you, Ron, for helping me know how to pronounce that correctly. Who had two wives. One was, now why would you do that? That was a thing then. Okay. Um, and one was named Hannah, and then there's the other one who they make to be the mean one, who would, was described as her rival and would taunt Hannah because she couldn't have children, which is difficult for many people today. People pray for that today and don't get the result that Hannah got, which begs the question again, does prayer work? What was the thing that happened here that allowed this to take place? But in the meantime, her rival would provoke her severely. Anybody here today feeling provoked by different places or different people in the world? Today, can you relate to this irritation, to this, this distress from being provoked for something that you would like to be but isn't the case and other people are provoking you because you are in pain and poking at your pain intentionally? And Hannah wept and would not eat. Has anybody been shedding tears recently for one reason or another? Has anybody found it difficult to eat? To walk through the day the same way that you had just a little while ago? Well, Hannah went up and prayed, and even then in her prayers was being mocked by Somebody in the religious community misunderstanding her prayers and her actions. Has anybody felt mocked by other people in religious communities or seen other people being mocked and provoked by people in religious communities today? And then Hannah says, I will dedicate, if I get this son, I will dedicate him to be part of a particular religious dedicated group. Which begs the question... Why should Hannah have the right to determine the fate of her child just because she wants to have that child? But that's a message for another day. 
But she's in distress, and she's like, I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and distress. Is anybody experiencing great anxiety and distress? It may not be. You may not be, and I hope you are not. But if you are, there is someone who can relate to that. And Hannah got her wish, but other people asking for the exact same thing have not, which begs the question, does prayer work? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what? Some people, me at times, other people at times, treat God like God is a vending machine. Sometimes it is for money, and that money may be needed. Sometimes it is not, but sometimes it may be needed. I'm not even criticizing the fact of the need, and people will pray for money or pray for a car, and they may need that car. That car may be the, dif the difference between being able to get to work, not to get to work, their family system falling apart or not falling apart. I'm not criticizing the ask, the money, the car, the test, like I did, or the result of a test that may be coming in a medical test, or asking for help for themselves or somebody else, all legitimate, caring, loving Acts, but expect and say, God, I need this, and act like a vending machine. And when the vending machine doesn't distribute, they'll shake it and say, come on, God. The problem with this isn't just that sometimes you don't get what you are asking for. It can be worse than that, because when you don't, sometimes people will say God doesn't care. Or that God doesn't exist. Or even worse that God does, but because you're not getting what you want, you say, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Or then we get into the form that I was describing at the very beginning. It's like, God, if I do this, will you do that? Or, or the one that says, God, if you do this first, which is our preference, right? Not us do our part first, but you do your part first, and then I'll do it. And then maybe we get what we want, and maybe we don't, and then maybe we do what we said we're going to do, and maybe we don't. So the question still beg, does prayer exist? And the answer is yes. But not necessarily how we think. And see, the thing is, it doesn't just have to be from a biblical or theological perspective. Study after study after study from reputable, non-theological oriented, non-religious oriented organizations, in fact, others that are dedicated to study things to prove that God doesn't exist, have come up with the same results time and time and time again. Maybe they go up by a certain percentage, down by a certain percentage. But these are verifiable statistical facts in the world that you can have, that 36% of people in the world who pray on a regular basis, who are facing the same levels of stress in their life, will have that stress reduced through prayer. 25% of people feel significant relief from major diagnosed clinical depression because of prayer. 68% of people feel greater peace than others who don't pray who are facing similar or the same circumstances. It doesn't mean they're totally calm, totally peaceful. It doesn't mean all the things that have been troubled go away, but 68% of people who pray on a regular basis feel greater peace than the same people going through the same thing who don't. Praying will reduce your blood pressure. For like 50% of the people, it is measurable, diagnosable, meaningful reduction in blood pressure, and that's not it. We're just getting started, folks. People who pray on a regular basis experience 30% less interpersonal conflict in their circles with friends and family or people in the community. Something that we could really use some decompression here in our hearts, in our family systems, certainly in this town of Bloomfield, Connecticut right now. 30% less conflict just through prayer, increased purpose and meaning in people's lives for people who pray versus people who don't. And to me, honestly, the most significant one to me, that doesn't mean it's the most significant one to you, but two-thirds of people who pray on a regular basis experience greater joy, and joy, by the way, is different than happiness. We will explore this idea and things during Advent, during our season of Journey to Joy. That is our Advent theme this year, Journey to Joy. But two-thirds of people 
who pray and have the same or similar circumstances to other people feel greater joy in their heart. When you look at all these things, there is no, his, there's no medicine in the history created by mankind, no medicine created in the history of the pharmaceutical industry that can do all this. Drugs have been approved with less effect and less proven statistical viability than this. And that's not even it. People live longer. Live longer. Study after study after study. People live longer and healthier and lives with more purpose. And they have a regular prayer life. How? How? One is because we begin to understand that there is something greater than us. That there is something greater than me, 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 I, I, I. And it's not meant like sometimes you'll see certain things that's made to make us feel small. No, but it is meant to take us out of the center of the universe and let us know that we are connected to something so much bigger, so much better, and help us feel connected and that we can impact that world and be partnered in with that world. Humility is the greatest antidote to the largest disease I believe we have in America, and that is the idol of individualism. If anybody wants to know why we are where we are as a country, and I'm not just referring to the election, but why we are where we are as a country is because we like to say me, 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 I, 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 and make our decisions based on our interest and my interest instead of thinking of the collective whole and the needs of other people. That simple change in mindset could change the direction of your life and change the direction of this country. The other is this, when you pray, you get more connected to other people. If you pray for your friends, if you pray for your family, you will feel, you will be more connected to them. If you pray for your family members who have injured you, even if you choose never to reconcile, because it's not always healthy to reconcile with people who have hurt you, but you will feel less anger, less resentment, feel less weighed down by the weight of anger and fear and stress and resentment in your life. If you pray for people who you do not know well, they pray, pray, the reason we pray for people here in this community of faith, wherever you are in this world, is we get a greater connection. I tell you each that I love each of you, and if this is the first time you've walked through this door, whether you believe me or not, I love you. I love you, and that is possible, and it wasn't always that way with me, and it is possible to love people who you do not know well, and if you pray, and you pray for their needs, and you pray for them, you feel more connected to them, and whether you actually get to know them in person during your lifetime or not, you feel more connected and less alone, and when you pray, you can pray for people who you will never meet, never interact with in your entire life, and it will increase your compassion with those people, your connection to those people, your love for things beyond yourself, and it won't make you feel diminished, it'll make you feel greater purpose, lower blood pressure, lengthen your life, greater joy in the midst of it all. The other thing prayer does is it brings you on a path closer to God. For those of you who haven't seen this image, this is the image that I use for God is the light and warmth and thing that is inside our hearts, but also out there because we cannot know exactly who that is or what it is like, but we can feel the love, we can feel the light, we can feel the guidance, we can feel the beauty of that God that is bigger than anything that we can possibly imagine. As we pray, we draw closer and closer and closer to this and the distance between us, which can feel sometimes when things are going wrong and the weight is on us, that the distance is unbridgeable between us and God. But as you pray, that distance can gradually close, become thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner 
and thinner until you can touch the divine, until you can touch the divine. A lot of people have been coming to me, particularly the last week. I don't know what to do. I'm so angry. I'm so afraid. I can't move. I am paralyzed. I, 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 I don't know where to go. I'm in absolute denial of the circumstance that I am in. I'm beginning to accept it, but I don't know what to do. And all of these words have one thing in common. They are stages of grief. There is a collective grief going on in this community of faith, in this community of Bloomfield, in this, in this country. And it's not universal, but it is true of most people in this congregation. And many of them have come to me for answers. And I do not have those answers. Not at this time. But I do know this. I know this as absolutely as I know that I'm standing right here seeing all of you, that there is a God. And that this God loves you. And this God wants you to be close. This God wants you to have the ability to feel close and to feel closer, and so has offered us this opportunity of prayer as a tool and a vehicle to have all of these wonderful experiences, even in the midst even as we walk through the valley, even if you feel like you're in the shadow of death, that this God is here to hold and guide you. And as you get closer to this God, this God will reveal that way. Will reveal what you are uniquely called to do and what we as a community of faith are uniquely called to do to add love, add compassion, add joy to our hearts, to your hearts, to this community, and to spread that into the world and have the ripple effects go farther than we can possibly imagine. And so pray. Whether it happens immediately or not, pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends. Pray for this community. Pray for this church. Pray for this greater Bloomfield community. Pray for this country. Pray for this world. And don't stop praying. Because that, that will bring us closer to each other, closer to compassion and love, closer the divine. It works. So don't stop praying. Amen. Do we have any joys to lift up today? Yes. Our son Jim laid off about a month ago or so ago, and he just uh, got a new job at City Road Hospital. He, our oldest son works there as a physical therapist, and Jim is going to be a marketing specialist, marketing and digital content specialist. So there he is. He's been employed since he's been here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chip's son was laid off a little while ago, just got a new job that increased uh, responsibility, salary, all that. This doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's going to be like that. I've been laid off twice in my career, and both times ended up in a better place. One of them was landing right here at Bloomfield Congregational Church. So when you are going through these difficulties, when we sit down, I'm like, look, this isn't the end. There might be something out there. It's not just a cliche. People experience it all the time. I have experienced it as possible for you as well. Other joys? Yes. Um, Pastor Sean is speaking about prayer. 
teaching had nothing to do, you know, because I'm retired and don't have children to drive me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't change it for nothing. No. They are my joy, they are my heart. So I prayed, and my answer, I got my answer. It took a while, because mm -hmm. God answers prayer on his time, not our time. So this morning, I'm thanking him with great joy. They are home enjoying their, their birthday, but I'm here because I wanted to give thanks for God. Mm. Yeah. Amen. That's a testimony right there. Lifting up prayers for I-1 and I-2 and grandchild 1 and grandchild 2 there. <laughs> yes, John. I was raised in the Christian faith. Your spirituality was so connected to the work that you put in to it. And I've had to learn how to balance myself a little bit when, I come, when it comes to that. However, as, dis as distressing this time is right now, it's actually very exciting to think that I have a lot of work to do. And that in and of itself is an exciting thing. It brings me joy to know that I have a purpose, I have, I have a goal, and that we as a community have the same thing. We have lots of work to do, and that is exciting as a community. Mm -hmm. For the ability to have purpose and meaning and make a difference in spite of and maybe even because of the challenging times that we are in the midst of right now. Yes. Last week, and part of that joy included being able to hear Mikey Martell and his wife Amanda perform, and then to come to church today and have two more Martells <laughs> For the joy of the travel and hearing Mike Martell's performances, he's a recording artist, a producer, and uh, it's wonderful to see him once in a while uh, here, but to also be with the Martells, the Robinsons here with the Martells, and their friends say, Marnie. Yes, we're glad to have Lisa Williams. Lisa uh, has had a uh, heart <laughs> Had major heart surgery a while ago, a couple things, and then, but it's back here and, and joyful, uh, joyful today. So we do need resources to do what we do. But we don't pass a plate here because we don't want you to feel obligated to give. We don't you want to feel like we're putting something under your nose that makes you feel like, oh, I have to do something. Giving is an opportunity, is a form of prayer. It is a form of prayer. It is a form of giving that is important. And we are not shy about asking because we need it, because you need it, because giving will make your life better. It also enables us to do the things that we can do in this community to be impactful and to be relevant and to show people a way that is different that we need so desperately today. But right now, just appreciate the things that are going well, the gratitudes, the joys that are in your life, and reflect on them as we have this time of gratitude. And please feel free to join in as the singers sing 10,000 Reasons.
Let us pray. God of grace, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together no matter where we are here or throughout the world, wherever, wherever we are in our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for new opportunities, even when the path to them isn't of our choosing. Thank you for friends and family and friends that are to be and people we will never know who we can still touch. Thank you for travel and being able to be with those friends and for music. Thank you for the miracles of modern medicine and the joys that we get to experience each day. Thank you for the blue skies and the falling leaves, the sun, the food that is here today, and the generosity of spirit that exists so profoundly in this community of faith. Thank you for this community of faith and the way that they share in each other's joys and pains and make this world better through love and action, bringing hope and a little bit more joy to the world. Thank you for thin spaces where we feel you even more strongly, spaces that open more frequently and more widely when we pray. Thank you for prayer, the opportunity to connect closer to you and for the power of it even when it's so often misunderstood. Thank you for people who sacrifice a bit of themselves to make it better for others. May the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does, which is to take that generosity and multiply it, oftentimes in ways that we get the blessing to see, but more often in ways that are more profound and more powerful than we can possibly imagine. Amen. Now please rise and bow to your spirit as we sing our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Thank you for being here today. I hope this service was meaningful to you. I know it was deeply meaningful to me. After the service, you're welcome to join for fellowship time and time to gather together. You're welcome to join in bringing the food into Fellowship Hall and beginning to sort it, if you would like, at 1130. Uh, there'll be a demonstration and conversation about the Virtual Reality Project uh, in the living room. And then today at 3 o'clock, the 75th anniversary celebration of the Wintonbury Historical Society with a piano concert uh, and show tunes concert here. And you're welcome and invited to all of those things. But before we go, the benediction. Spirit's moving in here today, my goodness gracious. Hairs up on my arms there, Mindy, thank you. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance and inspire you to do love in action. Inspire you to pray and be more connected than you have ever felt in your life to each other and to touch the divine. Go in peace. Just move it out. <laughs>